to say live now. No, Brian's. Oh, there we go. There we go. There it is. There we are. Excellent. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we have a great speaker for you today. His name is Chris Bouguet and he is going to uh, give us a great presentation on teaching language with block coding and robots. Um, so we will just let him jump right in. If you're joining us on Slack, we are in track three. So go ahead and join that group if you haven't yet. And um, take it away, Chris, it's all you. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me here. And uh, I really appreciate this. I really love, if you missed the opening segment there, the, uh, the welcoming remarks for Brian, he said that the, the theme for this year's AEC in the cloud is beyond the now, right? And this session is all about that. I mean, it actually is about the now, but it is also about planning for the future. So I'm going to vamp here for a second, tell you a little bit about myself as you grab the slide deck. Uh, the slide deck, um, and I, sorry, I got the slack up in on my phone here. So if it dies, I got to I'm trying to keep track over there. But this, the slide deck is all done in Google Slides and it's meant to be interactive. There's gonna be hyperlinks and things I'm gonna ask you to click on. Um, so you're gonna need it. So it's bit.ly slash coding in the cloud, um, or you can also scan that QR code and that will have it up. So um, can you put it in the chat in, over in the Slack that when you got it? Chris, we got it, I'm good, I'm good. Let's see it pop up in, the, in track three over in Slack um, this way. Some people like to have a two screen experience as well. Like they have, you know, sometimes even three where you have the kind of Slack on one screen, um, the, the video going on another, and then with someone else. All right, excellent. Oh, well, look at that. Rachel Madel's here, Marlene Cummings. Oh my goodness. Lauren, thank you for, for being here. All right, fantastic. It's like, oh, Cynthia, hey, how's it going? We've got a bunch of people showing up, so fantastic. Um, so who I am real quick is, my name is Chris Bouguet. I am a, I'm a speech language pathologist, but um, I think of myself more as an inclusive design facilitator with a background in speech language pathology. Um, I do, my official job title is assistive technology specialist, and I work for Loudoun County Public Schools, which is in Northern Virginia. So I'm in the Northern Virginia area. Um, now, the, the thing is, I, although I work for Loud and I do this kind of stuff on, on my own, like this is my, it's my hour lunch break right now, right? So I'm jumping over and doing this here. Um, so you all got the, 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 the slides? All right, fantastic. Then we're moving on. Um, uh, would somebody in track three go ahead and copy and, and paste the, um, the slide deck or retype it into track three? This way, if someone shows up late and they're like, where do I get the presentation? Like you can get it there as well. I think it's also linked on the, the, the conference page where you, if you're reading, if you're watching this in the window. So, but that would be super helpful. Okay, so I also got to write a book called The New Assistive Tech, Make Learning Awesome for All. So check that out. Um, and sometimes people say, I look like these guys. So if you're, ever, if you're wondering like, hey, who, what's this guy? He reminds me of somebody. I get this all the time that I look like Dan from Love It or List It. So sometimes James Taylor, but yeah, that's not me on the right-hand side. That's some show called Love It or List It. I don't know if you've seen that, but um, that's what people say I look like. So you can now get that out of your brain. That's who, who I look like. We can actually get to the robots, right? And the coding, all right. Oh, one last thing. I do a podcast called uh, Talking With Tech. Oh, I got to update that slide, Rachel. It's um, talkingwithtech.org. Uh, Rachel and I, uh, Rachel is a private speech therapist that works out in California. And then there's me over here in Virginia. And we uh, put out a free episode every week. Uh, Brian has been on it a bunch of times. Uh, many, many AAC users um, have been on the show. Uh, and so the way it works is that Rachel and I get on, we talk about some sort of topic related to AAC for about the first 15 minutes, 20 minutes of the show. And then we usually launch into some sort of interview uh, with somebody that's a stakeholder in the show uh, or a stakeholder in AAC. So, um, so yes, please check it out. Uh, did, are, are you listeners? Is anyone listening? Please um, go ahead and put it in the, in the chat if you listen to Talking With Tech. Again, free stuff. So we put out a new episode every week. In fact, I think we'll have one out tomorrow with someone who's a presenter in AAC in the cloud. So, um, okay, this whole presentation, when I think of AAC, I think of it as a continuum of consideration, selection, 
implementing the AAC and then reflecting on it, so how we can do that better. And this entire presentation is going to live in this implementation phase. Um, before we get too far into this, uh, into the robots and the coding, which is really what this session is all about, I have to give you some of the kind of, I don't mind what I call my core beliefs um, that I've learned over the years when it comes to AAC. Uh, so I think of them as six. There are six necessary components or my six necessary core beliefs when it comes to uh, implementing AAC. And the first one goes hand in hand with the theme of the whole conference, which is uh, beyond the now, is that you have to believe they will. Right? You have to you have to have this belief that the AAC user is going to do more than just um, make choices and identify blue and red. Which, if you missed the opening session that Brian was talking about that for a while, that's what that the the educators working with his daughter had. That's all they had her doing. And now, all these years later, with proper instruction, she's working on physics and she's she's um, uh, fascinated and curious about outer space, you know, not, and he said beyond just planets, but like the actual physics of outer space. So that, that could be a whole lack of imagination if we don't believe that students will someday be able to do whatever it is uh, we think they, we, we want them to do, right? So number one, believe they will. Second, believe they will what? Well, believe that they will be able to say whatever they wanna say, however they wanna say it. Um, whenever they want to say it, to whomever they want to say it, essentially communicate language the same way or as very similar way that I construct and, and say language or you do, uh, someone who's verbal. This is an acronym called SNUG. Again, in the Slack, are you familiar with SNUG? Can you write, yep, familiar or no, Chris, what are you talking about, SNUG? Um, will you put it in the chat? I need to know if I need to discuss it at all. Uh, so I'm w looking for chat for some feedback about how much time I should spend on it. L. Carswell is familiar with Snug? Yep, yep, yep. Okay, it's, I get the feeling that if you're in AEC in the cloud, you know what Snug is. If you don't, it's okay. Um, it's basically spontaneous novel utterance generation. You're trying to say, again, say whatever you want to say. You can generate spontaneous utterances. All right, number three, core vocabulary. Um, oh, well, there's, sorry, there's a bunch of people that just said no. No clue what snug is. Spontaneous novel utterance generation. The idea that words are popping off the top of my head, I am spontaneously generating them. That is something we should be striving for to, to teach students how to do is construct sentences uh, using words and putting words in different combinations. Essentially language, which kind of trumps communication. Communication is an important aspect of it, but the idea that, um, that I could just point to goldfish cracker. Look, gold, I have a picture of a goldfish cracker. I could point to goldfish cracker and that's communication, but it's not really generating language, right? You need, you need both. Um, all right, so yes, thank you, Will, for putting that in there. Um, now, just to note, you have a slide deck. I've hidden most of these, these so they're not showing up here on the screen in the live in the live stream, uh, because this these are slides from a much longer presentation that goes into all of those. I left a bunch of those slides there, so you actually have links to like an ASHA blog post on Snug and everything else. Um, it's just not showing up here in the live stream because we're talking about robots, man, and coding, right? So of course, core vocabulary, again, I'm gonna guess most people know about, uh, about uh, core vocabulary, um, but is the idea that um, the most frequently used words is, is made up of like a set of 300 to 400 words. And if we could teach those 300 to 400 words, then we get kids, people 80% of the way there. It's not all the words, you still need what's called fringe vocabulary, like uh, nouns. Um, to kind of fill in the fill in and be more specific, but core vocabulary is sort of the centerpiece of the instruction. Okay, number four of six is motor planning. You got to try and keep the cells in the same spot. Uh, the more you move things around, the harder it is to find the buttons and learn what, what the words are, um, and become automatic and consistent. Right. So. Um, so that motor plan, imagine someone moved the keys on your keyboard and they would constantly be, you'd be, you would constantly be frustrated if you couldn't, if you were constantly searching for where the letters were on your keyboard, 
because someone moved them around. So you got to keep the buttons in the same spot. And that is actually an important precursor to what we're going to talk about here with the coding. Number five is aided language stimulation, which is the idea that um, the person needs to model. Uh, people are in the environment of this person who is using the communication device also needs to use that communication device. They need to be modeling on that communication device to teach them how to use that communication device. And you do that in at least the most prompting fashion. Again, much longer stuff, but I, again, very important when we're going to be talking about coding because kids, if they're going to learn to code, um, they could do it without you, but they could do it with you a lot faster if they saw you doing it or you're doing it with them. Again, model. And then the last part, fun. This whole thing about teaching uh, students to use AAC and teaching language, it has to be fun. It's communication over compliance. It's not about doing what I tell you you have to do. It's about um, really enjoying the experience. And what is more fun for students than playing with robots, right? I mean, uh, we've seen situations where we've had an autism classroom, um, it, a high school autism classroom, and the teacher said, okay, every day we do a 15-minute social group where it's, and it is pulling teeth. They don't want to do it. It's, we, we clock the time, and it is like the, the, the clock ticks backwards. Um, and because they just do not want to participate in this social group. And it's frustrating, but we have these social goals and we're trying to make it engaging and fun for them. Well, in one day they brought out the robots. They brought this to the social group and the kids were talking to the robots and talking to each other about the robots. And before they knew it, an hour had gone by and they actually had to stop the activity because transitions were coming up and they had to say, um, you know what, guys, we got to come back. And the kids were then asking questions on their communication device. Where is blue one? Uh, do more, do more. Can we play? Can we play? Like, so just completely awesome engagement with, with the robots because they're fun, right? Okay, so this is all about implementation and, and using the robots. It's all about designing educational experiences. A question that has been on my mind, and I bet you it's been on all of your minds, is what is school going to look like in the fall? What are these educational experiences going to be like when we go back into, this, into the buildings? And there's this presumption that just going back um, is the right thing to do. And I want to pose the question to you, which is, what is it that you can do in school that you can't do at home? What is it that makes school so special? And one of them might be participating in robots. Man, I have to go to school. I need to be in that building because the robots are there and I don't necessarily have robots at home and I want to go to there and I want to play with the robots and I want to program them and I want to see how they work and I want to build things with them and I want to play games with them. That's something you can probably do at school that most people cannot do at home. I mean, you can. I've, I'm at home. I have a robot, right? But um, And you, these are certainly commercially available so they can be done at home. But that is an experience to me that makes school makes it a place where school is uh, some place where people want to go, uh, kids want to go, not just go there because they have to go. So, I see a lot, or have seen a lot over the years, people doing sort of a same routine of you go to the classroom, you part participate in some sort of non-preferred activity that makes it really difficult, and behaviors go up, and then you get some sort of reinforcement of watching a video. I have nothing against watching videos. I'm all about watching videos, but I'm about watching those videos together. Let's watch the videos together, pause them, stop them, talk about them, not necessarily as a as a reinforcement. And I'm also a big fan of making videos. And again, what if we made videos that starred the robots, right? Um, or starred what we were doing with the coding. One of the other things I think if you asked, if you if you made a list, if I asked you in the chat, what do you think kids mo miss most about school? Go ahead, real quick. What, what, in one or two words, what do kids miss most about school? I have a guess what you're going to say. Is it their mean social studies teacher? No, it's not their mean social studies. It's 
friendships, their friends, right? Mm -hmm. Friends, seeing their other kids. Yes, it's the social piece of being with their friends. I asked my own daughter, Maggie, who's uh, going into middle school. I said, hey, they're talking about going back two days a week. What do you think uh, in the fall if we went two, back, two days a week? She's like, are my friends going on the same day? Like that's what's, what's, what's really, there's a social element to school that people really like. Well, that's the same thing when you go back in the fall, Peers, can we teach the peers about AAC? Um, I know um, there are some speech therapists that run communication groups without AAC users just to teach other kids about AAC so that then they can go and be part of those, um, those social groups uh, so that they know how to interact with somebody uh, who uses an AAC device. Um, if you're not familiar with um, Caroline Musselwhite's work on communication circles, that's the idea is that you would be teaching other kids how to interact with the AAC and how to be with um, good communication partners for someone who uses AAC. Uh, those are all just good intrinsic ways, but there are also like service hours that kids need to, to provide for certain organizations. They could be working on AAC. Um, and uh, and I could see um, project-based learning. So a project-based learning lesson is the idea that instead of kids coming and doing something the teacher says, they come to the classroom and they try and solve some sort of problem. The teacher has said, hey, we've got this problem. Uh, there's bees are dying. Can you help us save the bees? Or what problem are you invested in students? And one big problem we have is we, uh, how do you teach language to kids using AAC? So let's get other kids working on that problem, right? Let's get their peers working on that. Uh, working on that problem, and then we can all be working on it together, right? Um, so this is what makes school fun and engaging and enjoyable, is the social elements and working together to solve authentic problems, right? And you could do that around robots and coding and computers. Now, there's another big thing I want to talk about here, and that is this idea that um, in the world of AAC, we might be saying we're playing catch up with literacy. Like, oh, right, we should be teaching literacy to students who use AAC devices, like decoding, right? And fluency, right? So, so if that's the case, right? And this is why uh, Karen Erickson's work and the her, uh, her most recent book with Dave Copenhaver um, is, is so popular, is this, and Aaron Sheldon's work, who I know is participating in this, um, the idea that we're trying to teach literacy to kids and we're playing catch up. Well, right now, in the last handful of years, many states and many territories and many places around the world have started to adopt computer science standards. Literacy standards have been around forever, but computer science standards are kind of the new hotness. And so what I don't want us to fall behind is saying, oh, right, kids with AAC, we should teach them computer science as well. Yes, let's do that right now. Um, so, so, I'm going to ask you to take a second here and participate in a little activity with me. What I've created here is a hyperlink to a Google form that asks you to place a hyperlink in that Google form for the computer science standards in your area, right? I tried to look up like, computer science in all the states, you know, and I found this website, but that's just the states, not the entire world, you know. Um, and there's a this 2018 computer science educational report that kind of gives you the state of computer science standards in, in the country, in the United States. But again, that's not the whole world. And so I thought, why don't we participate in this together? If you click on this link, add the hyperlink here, right? Uh, there's a Google form. Go out, Take a moment, I'll give you maybe five minutes to go out and find, if you're in Maryland, what's the computer science standards in Maryland? If you're in Idaho, what's the computer science standards in Idaho? Uh, Lee, I know you're in Michigan, uh, who's the moderator for this. What are the computer science standards? All of these states, at least the United States, are adopting computer science standards for the schools. Let's not let AAC users fall behind and go, oh, geez, I guess we should have been teaching that too. Let's do it right now. So I'll give you a moment to go do that, and I'm going to click right here, and we will see the populate the we'll see as you look. There's Texas is added, perfect. Give you a second to go find because this would be an awesome list for people to have, and for you to share with your colleagues, not just in your own area 
but within other areas. There's Michigan. While you do that, I'll check and make sure I didn't miss any questions. Good. Oh, look at them. We've got California popping in, Tennessee, Maryland, uh -huh. New York. Any Canadian friends, Australian friends? You can also feel free to look up standards in other areas if you'd like. If you've already like, well, I did California, I'm done. Like, feel free to look up more if you want and post them in here. We can help out those states that didn't aren't here live. Those areas that aren't here live. I'll just give it another minute. See what else pop pops. And let me ask you: once you've populated it and you've filled out the Google form. Um, did you know this already, or was this new information to you? Did you already go ahead and put that in the in the Slack? Whether you knew you had computer science standards, or you're like, "Whoa, I didn't know we had computer science standards in our state." Um, I'm curious what your if this is new information to you. New, all right, sweet. Didn't know, all right. Some people are coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, good. That's good. That means you're spending time in the right place. All right. So we've got about a half hour left. Mm -hmm. So thank you for filling that out. And if you didn't finish, that's okay. It'll, it'll be here. Fill it out. And, you know, I'll probably continue to use that hyperlink in the, in the future. So uh, continue to go check it out. Uh, if there's other areas that, that, that uh, you want to check out or, or spread to your friends. Okay. okay. So what does this have to do with AAC, this whole computer science coding and robots? Well, at, uh, at early grades, uh, the way coding works is that it's actually taught with this thing called block coding. And in fact, um, the way block coding works is that it is puzzle pieces. In fact, let me just jump out of here and I'll show you. This is what it kind of looks like, okay? So I'm gonna go live here. I, I lost my captions, but uh, I hope it's okay. So note how this works. There's a canvas and most coding, block coding applications work the same way. There's some sort of blank canvas. And then there's commands over on the left-hand side. And when you click on one of those commands, it gives you some functions. So I'm gonna click on this function and I'm gonna drag this over here. And like a puzzle piece, it snaps in, all right? So, and then I'm gonna take this and uh, I can change the angle if I wanted to, but I'm just gonna do that. And then I'm gonna say this. And when I hit this green play button, what it does is it, well, it's telling me over here, hey, Chris, you don't have a robot set up. But if I connected this to the robot, when I hit this play button, it will follow these commands and the robot will then do what I've commanded it to do. So it'll go forward 50 units. It will then turn left uh, 90 degrees and then it'll turn right 90 degrees. Right? Some other options that I have here is I can have it look left. Uh, and so the head will turn, you know, in a certain direction. I can have it uh, play lights, you know. Uh, the, this particular robot has lights on its, on its side and it will light up. Um, I can have it play sounds, like play animal sounds, or I can record my own sounds, right? And I'm making this a whole sequence so that if I did connect this robot, let's see if I can do it real quick. When I hit the play button, it's going to send... Oh, it's gonna send commands to this particular robot. So now it's not on the ground, so you can't see it, but notice how it lit up when it got to light. It's making a horse sound. Now it's a little hard to hear because you can hear it. And it's playing sounds. 
Okay, I'm turning that off just so you get the idea. Does that make sense? What kind of questions do you have about block coding? Because it's really, I think it's kind of demystifying the fact that coding is like complicated. I hear these terms like Java and Python, and I'm a speech therapist, man. I don't do coding. Well, you can see it's just moving puzzle pieces around and putting them in order in sequence. Uh, and, and you can see how motivating it would be to see kids doing this. This website, good question, Caitlin, is called code.makewonder.com. And it's it's uh, it's for the Blockly, this particular robot is called the Dash Robot. I don't get sponsored by the Dash Robot. It's called Wonder Workshop, um, but it, it's very commonly found in schools. Uh, so, and I, in fact, I have hyperlinks in the presentation that are not shown of many other common robots uh, that you might see in your schools already. Um, so, so this is just one example though. That uh, of, a, of a website. In fact, the, the presentation has many more examples as well. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Lee, for, for putting that link in the, in the chat. It's also in the presentation as well. So let's talk about it for a second. On one level, this is very engaging for a student because you can imagine bringing this around and you're controlling the robot, right? Another activity would be working with your peers to program the robot. So imagine I'm the AAC user and I'm telling my peers what to do about moving, moving the block pieces around, what worked and what didn't work. Um, I might be commanding uh, um, my peers to do something. And commands are one of those pragmatic functions that we don't work on all that often. It's so much it starts with requesting. We might get to commenting, but giving commands to somebody else uh, is, is something as frequently, I think, doesn't come up as often. Well, this, you can give commands to the robot and you can give commands to your peers. Ah, yes. Dina, Dina asks, are there any block coding programs that work well with non-readers or any suggestions you have related to this? Yes, as a matter of fact, there are some that are just symbol-based um, so that you don't have to read. But that said, um, you can learn what these words mean forward by seeing what the robot does, right? By, even if I couldn't read what these things were, drag it over, hit the start button, and oh, it moved this way, right? Um, so I know what that puzzle piece does. You'll note how there's color coding. Does color coding remind you of anything? Anyone, AAC people? Right? Notice where the, the green color coding? Anyone? Yes, Candace, Candace wrote the Fitzgerald key. That's what I was waiting on, exactly, right? So there's some analogies you can make here because what coding is, is a language. Uh, and language, the words have meanings. And so in the very similar way that you would be teaching go or stop, if, if you're already familiar with um, core vocabulary, right? Then, well, you could teach the robot to go and stop. And oh, the buttons that I'm pushing on my AAC device have some sort of meaning just like these buttons over here have some sort of meaning. Does that make sense? Do you see the correlation that I'm getting, getting at? That, um, that learning this language or block coding is, the sa is similar to or an analogy to learning language using an AAC device. Because pressing certain words have meaning, and when I press those words and they have meaning, some sort of action happens. When I say eat, uh, uh, someone brings me food. When I say um, go, someone leaves. You know. Well, the same thing. When I pray, when I press look, this thing looks to the left or looks to the right or looks up or down. Right. So you can bring these things over. Also, notice what is something you might notice about these words over here. Take a look at these words here, or this, these words here. Are they? Are they calling out to you in any sort of way? Answer, uh-huh, yeah, not 100% core words, clearly, but many of them are, right? Wait, repeat, play, look, exactly, exactly. So there's a fun way to be teaching core vocabulary, a fun, engaging way to teach core vocabulary and pairing those words together, right? Um, all with the idea that you'd be working on those computer science standards, right? So now you might be going, well, okay, Chris, how much is this robot? And, and you know, what about other robots? That costs money. And you know that I'm trying to 
as it is trying to get AAC devices cost money and then it's the funding is difficult. I get that. So a couple things to talk about. The first thing is, is that robots exist in many schools already. You can partner with either your digital media specialist, like your librarians, or your if you have technology resource teachers, they might have these already um, and you might not know about them. So, and, and I'll ask those of you in the, in the chat, in the, do you have robots? Do you know what robots you have in your schools already? Um, that's one option for you without even having to look at grants or funding, you know. Uh, do you have robots and do you know which ones you have? There's stuff called Ozobots and EasyBots and all sorts of different ones that are out there. I'm curious what people have. There you go. Stacy says she has some in her lending library. If not, that could be an action item for you when you leave here, is to say, hmm, I don't know what robots we have. Let me go figure it out. Who could I connect with at my institution that says what kind of robots we have and that we can be borrowed, you know? So that's the robot element, which is a physical element. We do things, activities like uh, challenges, where you ask kids to make the robot go through a maze or tie it to, um, some sort of preposition that you're teaching, like go under, or over, or through. Um, many of the robots have accessories that come with them. This particular robot has like a, a launcher kit, like a, it, it throws like balls. So that's super fun. Throw, so you can get even more words. It has a sketch feature where you can essentially put a little harness on this and put a marker and then as it drives around, it's driving on paper. Um, and and more. There's a gripper that you can grab things. So those are some fun, engaging things you can do with the robots. But even if you don't have robots, let's just talk about coding in general. Okay, so I'm going to jump back to the presentation here. Um, this, uh, let me go full screen for a second so I can get my captions back. Um, so this robot right here was, and this is a YouTube video that we're not going to watch right now. But it was a challenge that I gave to my uh, my son. I said, okay, we got this Dash robot. Um, can you teach, again, as peers, uh, peer help, helpers or peer communication partners or as an authentic learning problem, uh, can, you, can you create a video of the Dash robot teaching the word, some core vocabulary words like go? And so he made this maze and he made a little program um, and then he had it, I don't know if you can see, but there's like uh, food items hidden at different parts of the maze. So there's like a bag of carrots, you know, and just off screen to the, to the south here, there's like a, a can of tomatoes. And so Dash went and tried to found them, find them. And whenever he'd find them, he would say, go. And he would drive and he'd turn and he'd turn. And then he'd find it and he'd say, eat, right? My son doesn't use AAC. He's teaching core vocabulary to those who need AAC. Okay, so there's a link to the Blockly app. <coughs> Here's the Swift Playgrounds. So Swift Playgrounds is a, is a app for iOS devices that is free, that teaches you how to code. Uh, it takes students from very basic coding and gets it eventually more and more complex. You can see here, some of the text is move forward, move forward, move forward, and it moves this little, guy forward 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 until he gets this little red gem and you're learning how to practice practice pra you're learning how to code by doing this engaging thing well what's so cool about this swift playgrounds besides the fact that it's free and i don't know if you saw this but um just yesterday at uh, wwdc which is like the big apple conference they announced the swift playground student winners they have challenges all the times so that uh, eventually you get so good at the swift playground you you start creating your own things. You're not just following along with scripted lessons. Well, so so they had student winners. So that's something that students can engage in. But Jane Odom and I experimented with the new voice control for iOS. So voice control allows people to um, turn on uh, almost any app uh, that's, that's coded this way. Swift Playgrounds happens to be coded this way. And it puts numbers over the different commands on the iPad. So like if I wanted to hit run my code, I might need to use my finger to hit run my code. Well, with voice commands, I can hit, I can just say, 
uh, play 20 or run 20 or hit 20 or press 20 and it'll it will then activate that for me oh am i still here hey sorry we lost our connection let me get this up live again okay oh no it says it's still going am i still going can you guys still hear me track three Yeah, you're good. Okay, good, oh, good, good. good. So, okay. <laughs> everybody, something just went wonky for a second. Okay, yes, thanks everybody, thank you. So, so you can turn on this voice control and what's so powerful about this, it's like, well, Chris, we're talking about AEC, what are you talking about using your voice to control the iPad? Well, a student can use their communication device if they don't have the fine motor control to touch the iPad, they can use their AAC voice, their synthetic voice, to control the iPad. And we've tested this out mostly with PRC devices, so you can test it out with other uh, apps as well. Um, but it works, it works. It recognizes the, the, the synthesized voice. So this gives even more opportunities for students to learn how to code. Um, it's because you can do these free programs. Okay, so I just wanted to give you a couple websites that you can go. I know some of you are asking, what are some different options? Uh, for, for different ones. So these are just a handful. There are others and feel free to reach out to me if you need more. Um, but here's some that start with kind of the block coding, Scratch for instance, and then here's some that do text coding. I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna show you another example of one here in a second. Okay. Um, in fact, let's, let's go there now. So here is, um, yeah, okay. So here is uh, the example I wanna show you. It's a Star Wars one, okay? So even if you don't have robots, all you have access to is a, an internet device. Uh, this is a website that allows you to do block coding. And instead of talking to a physical robot, like, um, like the Dash robot in my hand, you can do a virtual robot like BB-8 over here. Right? So when I hit run, it's gonna move right, move right. So let me hit run. And look, BB-8 got the scrap metal. Should I keep playing? Yes, I'm gonna go on to the next most challenging one. And so over here, as it refreshes, see I'm on, I'm on level two, right? And it says, uh, Ray says, we need more scrap metal. Can you get the metal in this area? So chat, what do I have to do? What do I have to drag over to get this both pieces of scrap metal? Well, I have move right, move right, move down, move down. So I had actually practiced these beforehand. So Let's do number three together, okay, everybody? Here we go, we're gonna do number three. So this one is not gonna be filled in. All right. Go quickly, BB-8. Look, there's Kylo Ren is coming after him. So how do I get both of these? What do you think I have to do? Right now it's programmed, when I hit run, it's gonna to move to the right. How do I go up? How do I get both of these? What do you think? Anyone in the chat? I hear go right, then I have to go up. Saskia, and then I have to go back down. And then I have to go, oh, let me snap it in there. And then I have to go right. All right, let's see if that's right. We did it, we did it. But you see how that could be a fun challenge uh, for students to progress through. And it gets progressively more difficult. And if you don't like Star Wars, if you like Minecraft or you like Frozen or you like something else, there are different ones that you can participate in here. Um, but you get the idea of how the block coding could work. It's not that complicated and it's not that intimidating. And you could imagine how this might work for lots of students. Can you show what happens when you get it wrong? Lucas, I'm gonna let you try that on your own because we only got 15 minutes left. But I'll tell you, it's pretty errorless. Uh, it basically just says, mm, that's not right. Can you try again? Okay. So the next thing I want to show you, again, getting back to the peers. Uh, oh, let me talk before the get talk to the peers. Let's talk about these organizations. So there are organizations that exist out in the, in the world that are meant to help people learn how to... Um, 
be better at coding, right? To, and uh, many of these organizations help help people who have traditionally not been in the STEM fields. So I just linked four of them here that you can check them out on your own. But these are all different organizations. In fact, I think I have, you know, here's my girls who code pen that I got at a conference recently. But you know, that's to help girls, that, that organization helps girls who code. Black Girls Code is of course helping black girls learn to code so that these underrepresented fields can, can be um, more represented in the future. So check them out. These might be organizations you could bring to your school or that you can invite students to be, become a part of, um, again, to program the next future of AAC. Or if you're an AAC user yourself, become part of those and become a programmer yourself. All right, this is another example. I said even, even more coding considerations. This is another example of where I challenged my son and his best friend who were participating in a class. They were the first, um, in our neck of the woods, we have something called uh, CAMS classes, coding at middle school. And coding at middle school, um, what that does is it takes the place of a language. So instead of taking German or um, French or Spanish, they took a year of coding at the time. And what they were, what they were learning in that particular class was um, Scratch. Scratch is a software program uh, that is free, uh, put out by MIT, and it is starts off with this block coding as well. And what I asked Tucker and AJ to do here is, I, again, just like I did with the actual Dash robot, I said, can you create something in Scratch to teach the word go? And what they came up with is, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna click on it, I'll, I'll let you do it on your own, it, but they created a this little animation that when you hit the, the play button, the run button, it sends a boat across the screen and the word go pops up. And then you hit the space bar and an airplane goes across the screen and the word go pops up. Again, an authentic way for them to try and uh, solve this problem of how do we teach core vocabulary to students who need to learn core vocabulary, right? Now, even if it wasn't AAC users, this, this is a good program that they could use to teach kids just the sight word go, or you learn to uh, decode the word go because it's, pro it's providing um, a, a sensory experience. Yeah. So this is Wonder Workshop. This is the, the next bunch of slides uh, hidden. This is only one slide. This is how you can get to, if you want, the, the company that produces this particular robot, the Dash robot. Um, but, uh, and it shows you the different access accessory charts. It has a curriculum that you can follow. Uh, they do have professional development courses and there's a link to the different costs there. The, the next bunch of slides are hidden, so they're not on the screen, but there are other companies that have uh, robots as well. Um, and I tried to put links in there for you so that you could, would save you some time when you were going to hunt down what you might like. Um, and you could see like what might, might work in your neck of the woods. I mean, I think these Dash robots sold separately are like $150. Um, so you could be looking at a grant or something like that uh, to, or, you know, or ask your, however you get funds uh, to get them. That could be the, the, the first part there. All right, so with the last, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes here, what I'd like to do is to challenge you. I'd like to challenge you to come up with a little lesson using core vocabulary um, and using coding to, to design some sort of experience around some sort of teaching that core vocabulary word. You know, let's say it's in. What could you, what would you do with coding in a robot to teach the word in? Um, and so I, this links to just a, a lamp words for life one sheet. It could it, it could be any uh, core vocabulary like home screen of any AAC uh, app because most of them have core vocabulary on the front. Uh, but just if people weren't unfamiliar, I wanted to have some people with uh, to provide some quick link. So so that's what that takes you to. But I'm going to ask you to design some sort of 